everybody. It's good to be together like this again and we offer a special welcome to those who are joining us on YTV and Arrow FM. We trust that you'll be blessed as we look into God's Word together. Shall we just pray? Father, I thank you so much for your Word, Lord. In it you are revealed and Lord, you are beautiful, you are wonderful and to know you is the greatest passion of our lives. So Lord, I pray today as we look into your Word, would you reveal yourself to us and Lord would you change our hearts Lord God would you cause um, our hearts just to be filled with peace and, and revelation of you in Jesus name amen amen we're going to look today at Psalm 23 verse 1 to 2 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters before Easter, we were talking uh, through the, the, the 23rd Psalm, and we were looking at the characteristics of God that we find there, and how we should respond uh, to those characteristics. A.W. Tozer says this, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And it's so important to let our understanding of God be shaped by what He reveals of Himself to us in the Word. If we respond in, in faith to that revelation, we will encounter the real God. If we respond to a God of our own making, we will be very disappointed and it will actually turn into idolatry. In our last study, we were looking at the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah, which we transliterate as Jehovah. And we, we learnt about it where uh, Moses asked God who he was, who was sending him. And God said, I, I am a Jehovah. And it comes from the Hebrew for I, I am who I am. And God was saying, I, I, I am, I have always existed and, I, and I, I, I always will exist. I'm not defined by anything else. But that name Jehovah is often, uh, we find it in the Old Testament together with a characteristic, which is the essential nature of God. And when we learn those names, we see this is who God says, this is who I am. I, I exist as this. And, and last time we were together, we looked at, at Jehovah Ra'ah, which is the Lord is my shepherd. And it was wonderful to see um, the trait of God, that he is essentially a, a shepherd and always will be and always must be a shepherd. Uh, today we're going to look at a, a second characteristic of God which is almost inseparable from the first and we see it here in, in, in this psalm that we've looked at here right here in verse 1 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and today we're going to talk about Jehovah Jireh and in the Hebrew funnily enough it sounds almost the same as the, the Lord is my shepherd the, the word the root word there is is also ra'ah and um, we're going to ha have a good look at, at what this means it, it's it's the character of a good shepherd shepherd to provide and, and David says, I've been a shepherd and I know what a shepherd does. He takes his sheep to, to pastures that they can feed on. He takes them to still waters where they can drink safely. He protects them from, from all dangers and foes round about. And it's impossible to be a good shepherd without being a provider. But in order to understand this, this term we know as Jehovah Jireh, we need to go to the place that it's used in the Old Testament. And we're going to go to Genesis 22 and verse 1 to 18. Let's read together. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. 
And when they came to the place for which God had told them, of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide. As it is said in, to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens and as the sand of the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Beautiful, beautiful scripture that we've read through there. And in this passage, we see both the character of God revealed as well as Abraham's correct response. But if we are to understand this passage fully, we need to look for this Hebrew word, this little Hebrew word, ra'ah. It's a root word that means to see, to regard, to perceive, to consider, to give attention to, to provide, or present oneself to be seen. And we see this little word woven through this passage, almost tying it together in, in the fabric. And the first place we see it is in, in, in chapter in verse 8. And I've got in blue wherever we see where the root is ra'ah. And it says, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And uh, that word can be translated as God will see for himself the, the, the lamb. Um, the, the, the notes of the New English translation say that the, the best way to interpret this construct in the Hebrew is to look out for or to see to it. So it can mean to see, but it can also mean to see to it and thus provide. And that's why the translators have chosen that as, as, as one of the most common ways to translate that. And uh, it's beautiful. It obviously makes perfect sense in this uh, context. And what this story is telling us is that Abraham, he desperately desired a son. And he, he, he didn't have a son. And God said, I will bless you, Abraham. And Abraham said, what do your blessings mean to me without a son? Abraham wanted more than anything else, a son who could be his heir. And God had promised him that son and then miraculously provided the son. And then God, the Bible says God wanted to test Abraham, perhaps to see if the son hadn't become an idol that had taken the place of God in his life. And God asked Abraham to do something that was completely contrary to God's nature. It was completely contrary to God's law, and it was completely contrary to the promise that God had given Abraham. And Abraham was just super confused. What? Why would God ask me to do this? But the Bible says he still had faith and he still believed God. And in fact, in Hebrews 11, 19, it tells us that Abraham considered that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. And so he went ahead in obedience to God. But then when his son says to him, Dad, where's the lamb? He says, God will provide a lamb. He says, God will, he, he will provide for himself a lamb. And, and God was worthy of Abraham's trust because he did that. He, he provided a ram and that ram was sacrificed in Isaac's place. And that's, that, that, this leads us into um, where we see the second place that this, this word ra'ah is, is found. And in verse 14 it says, so Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. And you can see in blue again the words that have that root. This word, the Lord will provide, it's translated variously in, in different translations as the Lord sees, the Lord will see, the Lord provides, or the Lord will provide. And that's the name that's transliterated as Jehovah Jireh. You probably have heard of that. And you know that... I really believe when in the translation in the Bible we find two possible um, translations. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to, to us through both of them. And very often they're very complementary and they actually instruct us about each other. But the first thing we're going to look at is this, is, is, is Jehovah sees. And it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, thought that 
It's the very essence of a shepherd to be watchful. It's the very essence of a shepherd to be focused on the, on the welfare of his flock and to always be looking. Um, when we know of God's watchfulness, when we know that he is Jehovah who sees, it brings great peace to our hearts. Look at this incredible scripture, Matthew 10, verse 29 to 30. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Oh, sorry, let me get it up for you. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are numbered. That's the most incredible thing. Of all the billions of sparrows that have ever died, the Bible says God knows of every one of them. God has seen everyone fall. And he even knows when a hair falls from your head. He counts the hairs on your head. It's a job that gets easier and easier in my case as the years go by. But how incredibly personal is our father is our shepherd in in our lives he's deeply concerned with us as individuals we're not just another sheep in the flock we're not just another face in the crowd to him we're not just a number in a book we are a beloved son and he knows us he knows how many hairs there are on our heads look at this psalm this is a beautiful psalm here in in psalm 56 it says and you have kept count of my tossings and put my tears in your bottle are they not in your book then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. How incredible is that? Not only does God count our hairs, but God also counts our tossings. When we have an anxious night and we toss on our beds, when we cry, He keeps every tear in a bottle. This is an incredible attentiveness. He knows all our emotions, our fears, our tears, our struggles. When we're hurting, when people forsake us, when people gossip about us, when they reject us, when they bully us, whatever might, ha might happen, Jehovah Ra'ah knows, He watches, He sees, and He cares. Um, what joy that must bring us. What joy that can bring us if we believe and trust in Him. Look at this one. Psalm um, 121. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. How wonderful is not only does God watch us, but it's a 24-hour watch. I used to work on a ship and I was in the deck department and we used to go up the gangway and all through the night we used to do a patrol around the ship all through the night watching for fires or leaks. There was 24-7 someone watching a fire panel to check there was no fires. When you were at sea there were guys on the bridge wing watching the ocean, people watching the radar, watching the charts, watching the weather. And when you slept on that ship you knew you were in good hands, you knew that someone was watching. And the wonderful thing is to know that Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah who sees, is always watching. And we can rest peacefully. We see this also in the New Testament, uh, revealed in the person of Jesus, God in the flesh. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. We see here this word overseer is, is the word episkopos, and it's one of the functions of a New Testament elder. The epi means over, and skopos means a watch, a sentry, a scout, an observer, or a watchman. It also means to look ahead and to see the future. And this is who Jesus is, just like Jehovah is. Um, he is our shepherd, and linked with that is he is the one who sees over. He watches over our lives. He's able to see a better path because he sits at a higher vantage point, and he leads us in, in, into a beautiful future. That is who Jehovah is, Jehovah who sees. Um, fantastic, fantastic truths. Um, let's look now at the, at, at, the, at the other possible translation, Jehovah provides. And this comes directly out of his watchfulness. And we saw at the NET said that it means God will, pro God will see to it. So God sees, but God will also see to it. God will provide. The Lord is our provider. If God will see to it, we can leave it to him. We don't have to fret about things. Let's look in Jeremiah 29, verse um, 11 to 12. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will hear you. How incredible is this passage? God is a planner. He's a schemer. He's a dreamer. 
And he has great things in store for us, the Bible says. And the scripture tells us that God is able to work all things together for the good, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And that's exactly what God does. He's always planning the best scheme and strategy to lead us into great, a great future. He has all the wisdom. He sees the whole of our life stretched out before him. He sees into the future. And not only that, he has all the resources. God is the creator. Out of nothing, the Bible says, he called forth everything that we see. If you look into your future and think, there's nothing there for me. God doesn't mind. God, God's not faced. There might not be anything there. He says, I can call forth something out of nothing for you. And let him plan. Jehovah will see to it. We see this all through scripture. Matthew 6 and verse 31 to 34, it says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Beautiful, beautiful promises from Jesus. Uh, we face a world of economic uncertainty. We don't know what the predictions are and what the projections are, but how wonderful to look at these scriptures and know we serve. Our shepherd is Jehovah Jireh, the God who will see to it. We will not lack. We will not lack. What should our response to be? We're going to look at our response to this. And um, that's the nature of God. How can we respond? And Abraham teaches us many things in this passage about his response. He was a man of great faith and quick obedience. Twice in the passage, God speaks and he says, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. He was available and attentive and willing to listen to God. And God speaks to him and asks him to do something that tests him to the very core of his being. God speaks to him and asks him to do something that goes contrary to, to everything inside of himself. God asks him to make the ultimate sacrifice. And the Bible says, what, do, what does the Bible say Abraham did? The Bible says he rose early in the morning and he, and he set out to do God's will. And that's an incredible thing, that, that, that immediate, that first thing, obedience, is true obedience. Let's see what the message um, says um, if, in verse 16. It says, the messenger of the Lord says, Now I know how fearless you fear God, how fearlessly you fear God. You didn't hesitate to place your son, your dear son, on the altar for me. And that's a wonderful sort. I love that passage, how fearlessly you fear God. I said, oh God, help me to fearlessly fear you. When we fear God, we stop fearing man. When we fear God, we stop fearing the future. And when we truly obey God like that, our idols fall, our anxieties dissolve, because we know that God is in control. And he, his, our faith will unlock his power into our lives. This is especially true of um, financial provision. Uh, most of us know this. If, you, if you're talking about God's providence, you, you can't skip this beautiful passage in Philippians, this beautiful promise. We see it in posters all over the show and memes. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in, 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 in Christ, his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And we love that promise. But that promise comes in a context, in the context of a faith trigger. Let's look at the whole passage here in Philippians uh, 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 from 16 to verse 20. Philippians 4, 16 to 20. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here we see that great promise came in the context of the, the Philippian church's great generosity and their faith in giving to advance God's kingdom. And that trigger was the thing that brought about Jehovah Jireh providing their every need. We see that also all through scripture. Let's look at this um, uh, passage here in Corinthians. And it says, um, this is 2 Corinthians 9 and a few of the verses you can see there. The point of this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Then it goes on in verse 10, And he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And again, we see that incredible faith trigger. When we give like this, it proves that, that, that we put God before our, our money. We, we put God before mammon. And what happens is that faith triggers God's abundant providence. I like to share sometimes from, from my life and my own struggles. Paul said I shared with you not only the word of God, but my life. Um, we, uh, something I want to share, which I hope will encourage you. We received a bit of inheritance money from my dad. It came at a time, well, the stock markets went right down. The rand went right down. It was much diminished. But it came at a time with all this COVID-19 anxiety and worries. And Sandy and I have always believed that you honor the Lord, you worship the Lord with the first fruits of your, of your increase, and, and we believe that you give a tithe, the biblical amounts is a minimum of a tithe, and you give to your local church. We've always believed that even when I've been without a job, we've always done it in really hard times, but it was, this was sort of a scary world, and we thought, I thought, I was tempted, I thought, what shall I do? Maybe, Lord, maybe I should just put this money in the account. I'll leave it there, it's your money, and we'll just see if we're going to need it. And I was really, I wrestled with that, and then Sandy and I talked together, and we thought, wait a minute, no. The circumstances might have changed. The world might be very unknown at the moment, but God hasn't changed. His character hasn't changed. His promise hasn't changed. And His word and the principles that we find in the word haven't changed. And we made a decision. We said, Lord, we're going to tithe. And I'm telling you, it was incredible, the peace that I didn't have before. And as soon as I decided we're going to do that, it was like making a statement that we are not trusting in the world's economy. But we're putting our trust in Jehovah Jireh. And faith and peace flooded my heart like you can't believe. And I was like, yes, God, I know, I know that this, this pleases you. And, and, I, and I know you're going to look after us. And it was just, I don't know, I hope that, 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 that that's an encouragement. Um, Jehovah Jireh, the thing is God wants us as Christians in these times to tap into these incredible resources with our faith and our responsiveness to Him. He says, I'll give you everything you need for generosity in every place, in every way. And this is a time when the churches shouldn't be stepping back, but should be stepping up and just allowing God to use us to bring a blessing to a needy world. This is Jehovah Jireh who we serve, and he is able to powerfully meet our needs so that we can see the kingdom of God powerfully advancing. We see this in, in, in Abraham's life. He wanted that heir. It was the thing he wanted most, was someone to inherit his wealth. And God said, because you were willing to give him up, because you were willing to have that faith trigger, he said, I'm going to make you the heir of more people than you can count, more than the stars. I'll make you the father of the people of faith. I'll make you the father, the father of faith. And, and through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be, will be blessed. Through your seed will come Jesus, the Messiah, who will bless all the nations of the earth. And that's an incredible thing. Abraham's working together with God, his, his, his responsiveness to God. And we see, um, there's one more thing I want to look at Abraham, and, and, and it's got to do with this Hebrew word ra'ah again. We see that Abraham was, was one. Not only did he have faith and obedience, but he, had, he, was, he was able to see what God saw. We see that God is a God who sees and who sees to it. But Abraham has, this, has a very similar character infused into his life. And uh, here we see in, 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 in this passage, uh, 22, 33 to 4, and he went into a place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw, there's our little word, the place from afar. And um, it's incredible that um, Abraham was able to be a blessing to many generations and many nations because he was able to see. There's these two occasions when he didn't... God had asked him to do something heavy, and he was heavy-hearted, but he didn't look down. The Bible says he looked up, and he saw what God was showing him. He looked up, and he saw what Jehovah Ra'ah was seeing, and uh, he, he was able to come and partner with God because of that. And, he, and, he, and he, um, he, he started to see what God was seeing. He started to see what God was planning in the future. 
Let's look at the, at the second verse, which is, which is incredible. And it says, Abraham lifted up his, this is 13 to 14. It says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its, thought, its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The, the blue words again are our little root word. But what is incredible, in this first passage, it says here, on the third day, and I believe that the Holy Spirit, when, when He inspired the Scriptures, He always puts little flags to flag our attention to something that's important and to link our thinking to other places in Scripture. Now, when you see the term, the third day, you find it all through the Old Testament. What do three days speak to us most importantly of? The three days between the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So could it be that the Holy Spirit is saying, think about that in the context of this and the bible says that this hill this place that abraham saw was in the land of moriah now another passage in chronicles links the land of moriah to the city of jerusalem and it's very interesting we we we, we could imagine we don't know for sure but could it have been that here in jerusalem the hill where jesus was crucified this could have been the very same hill that abraham was seeing the hill of calvary um, there's, uh, uh, where he was going to sacrifice his son, God was going to sacrifice his son for us. And there's a whole lot of an interesting parallels. We see here that um, he put the, the wood, of, oh no, sorry, it's not in this passage, but he put the wood um, for the sacrifice on Isaac's uh, back and Isaac carried it up the hill. Jesus took the wooden cross and carried it up the hill. Abraham received Isaac back from the dead allegorically or, or typically because uh, you know, the Lord spared him but God received Jesus back from the dead through the resurrection there's amazing parallels and I'm sure that Abraham was seeing prophetically into the future we know that from the fact that in John 8 verse 56 um, this is what Jesus said your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and and was glad so we know from Jesus that Abraham looked into the future and he saw the day of the Messiah. He saw Jesus. He saw that God would provide a lamb. And what's interesting is Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide a lamb. And then they look around and they see a ram. What, what, what happened there? Was Abraham, did Abraham get it wrong? Or was he actually seeing right into the future and prophesying of the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world on, on Calvary, on that hill? And that's where we could, could imagine that this, where, where he says there, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Is what he's saying there talking about, Mount Calvary, where, where, where it is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, God's final, God's great plan of salvation, the greatest thing that man could, God could do, the greatest providence God could do. Could Abraham have been prophesying about that? It's an interesting thought. But one thing we do know is that Abraham definitely was one who saw and who saw the things that God saw and saw the things that God was doing and he believed that God would provide. What is the message to us? What, what, what can we learn from, from, from Abraham when we look at God and we see him as Jehovah who sees? We see him as Jehovah who will see to it. We can go forward into a new world with many unknowns but with an absolute confidence not looking down, but looking for the opportunity, looking for what God is wanting to do prophetically in the earth. We should be looking for solutions to the problems that the earth is going to be facing because God wants to help us. He wants to give us the wisdom of Daniel and Joseph to help, help in those things. We should be looking for ways to bring God's kingdom, bring God's love and, 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 and His message to, the, to those who have been resistant. We should be looking, even as Christian business people, for business opportunities that God wants to show us that we can see the resources flow to helping the needy or to extending God's kingdom. They say that we have what's known as the reticular activating system or your RA. And the way you see this is when you buy a particular type of car and suddenly you notice that car all over the show. Suddenly you see hundreds of people have got it. And that's because your, your brain is programmed to recognize that thing. Now, we need to have the same thing happening with, 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 with God's vision. That we're not looking down, but that we're attentive to see. If we think, oh, everything is bad, 
We won't see the opportunities we'll be looking and saying, God, what are you seeing? We've got one last scripture today. It's in Ephesians 3, verse 20 to 21. And it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love this passage because it says God can do abundantly, super abundantly, exceedingly more than anything we could dream or imagine. Or anything we could think. And this word think means to exercise the mind, to cons uh, consider and perceive. But I like what the message says. The message puts it like this. Um, uh, oh, golly, I don't know what's happened to my um, slide there. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, the message says, God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. And I like the message using the word imagine there because part of our thinking is our imagination. And if you think about your imagination, how often it can actually cripple you. When I was a kid, I saw the movie Jaws. And we were so terrified as kids by that movie, we wouldn't put our toe into the suburban swimming pool in the middle of the night or, or, or at night for fear of being eaten by a shark. But as I grew older and I learned more about sharks and I, and I became more rational in my understanding, it was based more on truth. I've spent many hours, many, many hours enjoying snorkeling in, in sharky waters. I've even scuba dived with those beautiful creatures without fear because my, my imagination hadn't run away with me. As we look into the future, what's sparking our imagination? What's fueling our imagination? What are we seeing? God's given us our imagination to dream the dreams that He is dreaming and to, to, to let the Holy Spirit ignite our imagination to see the possibility. If we're allowing our fears to fuel our imagination, we're going to end up terrified and, and, and not doing a thing. But if we become like Abraham, and we recognize that God is Jehovah, Ra'ah, God who sees, God who provides. And we, like Abraham, are looking to see what God is seeing. God will be able to use us to unlock blessings to other generations and to other nations, to all the nations, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the, the, the beautiful person of Jesus Christ. Just before we sign off today, we're going to pray together. And there might be somebody listening today who's never seen God in the way the scripture reveals him as a, as a loving father as a caring shepherd as a, as a watchful provider and uh, you've been challenged by what you've heard and perhaps you, you you're looking for hope put your hope in jehovah jireh he sent jesus to die on the cross in the same way that that ram was sacrificed in isaac's place jesus died to take the penalty of sin your sin and my sin upon himself but the Bible says he rose again on the third day so that we can have eternal life and a relationship with God. And all we need to do is say, God, you've got to help us. Forgive our sins, cleanse us. And, and um, he will come and he will transform us by the life that, that, that he has to offer us. So we're going to pray. And I want, if you'd like to pray just before I round off, uh, let's pray together. Um, Lord, I just thank you for um, those who might be listening or watching that... Are, are, have been stirred by your word, Lord, and just want to make a commitment to you. And I pray that right now they will just say yes, say yes to Jesus. Say, Lord, please help me. Please uh, forgive me. Please give me new life. I believe uh, you died for me, and I believe you rose again, and I make you my Lord. And Lord, I pray for, for anyone who's, who's, that's been the prayer of their heart today, that you would just touch them and bless them and bring them into your kingdom. And Father, I pray for us as your saints. I pray, Lord, that you would um, cause us to be able to rest in the incredible knowledge that we follow and we serve Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees to it, the Lord who sees and the Lord who will see to it, the Lord our provider. Help us to be a people of faith and obedience who can trigger your great providence, Lord, and help us to be a people who see the way you see. Help us to look at the future, Lord, with our eyes not not downcast, but full of faith in what you're wanting to do in partnership with us. So we put our faith and our trust in you, and we bless you this day. Use us, Lord, to bring you glory and to bring you honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.